was a, a very lovely introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, it is a great honour to be at the Welsh Centre for International Affairs. And I was asked to um, sign the visitor's book. And the, the first signature in the visitor's book uh, was Desmond Tutu. So uh, I feel an extraordinary company uh, and a bit daunted, uh, not least also by Emir Jones Parry, who um, some years ago I met in the Foreign Office as he was heading off to be uh, the UK's ambassador to the UN. So uh, uh, it is um, uh, uh, a great privilege to be here today. I'm very happy to answer questions about the range of Amnesty's work, but I thought I'd talk a bit about some of the things that we're uh, are occupying us at the moment in terms of the Middle East and North Africa, Syria in particular, and one of our campaigns which uh, is uh, coming to a very uh, um, particular moment in terms of the uh, uh, our campaign for an international arms trade treaty. So if I talk a bit about that, and just to, to say in terms of our worldwide membership, it's about three and a half million at the moment. So we have a, a very uh, a, a, a strong global uh, membership and a very strong uh, membership here in the UK. But looking at uh, what has been happening over the last couple of years in the Middle East and North Africa, I think that uh, you know, people, nobody really predicted uh, the scale um, of those huge protests that swept across the Middle East and North Africa. But when you look back, uh, at what was happening, uh, there, it was in many ways predictable. Protest and dissent had been growing across the region for years. When you look back over uh, decades, you see a region uh, largely ruled by autocratic regimes who maintain their grip on power by deploying secret police, intelligence agencies and military forces and allowing them to commit human rights abuses with absolute impunity. And across the region, the same themes of abuse uh, were clear. Torture and unjust imprisonment, unjustified restrictions on freedom of expression, the suppression of the rights of women and members of ethnic, religious and other minority groups. And for decades, the international community and the attitude of the international community was stability rather than change. Better the devil you know, and a blind eye being turned to human rights abuses, corruption, poverty, arms deals being brokered, diplomatic assurances and renditions of people, uh, and women in those countries being totally marginalized. And I think the signal that was absolutely being given was to those regimes was we'll tolerate your repressive behavior as long as you support our strategic uh, interests. And I think that, you know, when I've, um, uh, Emma mentioned three missions in, in Egypt, and in all of the conversations that I've had with people who were very much part of um, Tahir Square and of the uprisings that took place, uh, people from the slums of um, Cairo, uh, activists, many, many people, they absolutely know that Mubarak and his regime lasted for as long as it did because it was propped up by the West. And there is a price that is paid uh, for that knowledge and for the fact that people absolutely feel that. But when the protests came, the largely peaceful demands for greater freedom and human rights were often met with extreme ferocity, violence by regimes that thought that they could absolutely get away with murder. And we've seen a really large scale loss of life and injuries to thousands of men, women and children. Uh, and partly that has also been facilitated by the weakly regulated arms trade uh, that, has, that saw those regimes and seized Syria at the moment turning their weapons on their own people. So my, my experience in Egypt over three uh, different missions from Amnesty uh, in the last year, 18 months, has been one of um, working with women's organizations in that country, uh, women who were absolutely part of what was happening in Tahir Square and have been absolutely part of the fight uh, for human rights um, since then. Women who've talked about the intimidation that they uh, faced, uh, I met uh, very recently one of the young women who has taken that case of virginity testing uh, through the courts uh, in Egypt. So young women, women being taken off the streets, taken out of Tahir Square, forcibly virginity tested uh, by uh, army 
uh, um, apparatchiks who have totally abused those women and they are fighting back and they continue to fight and argue for women's rights uh, and absolutely I think there is a, a sense there of the long term concern about the Muslim Brotherhood and what it will mean for, for human rights but absolutely that sense that uh, there is democracy uh, and uh, they overthrew a tyrant uh, they will fight for their rights. There is a long game here in terms of winning that and looking for the international solidarity uh, for that. It was also the case in, in Egypt where it was the people in the slums. We did a, 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 a piece of research on uh, the conditions in many of the slums in Cairo and forced evictions that were taking place. And so I spent a couple of weeks visiting, uh, during a, a period of Ramadan, uh, visiting people in those slums, talking with activists and, and with community organizers and ordinary people who had been part of Tahir Square and their hopes and their ambitions absolutely uh, to be part of determining uh, what happens in their country. And of course, what we see at the moment is uh, still uh, issues of instability, but also uh, some changes. And it is uh, one of those areas that we, as Amnesty, will absolutely make sure that we're there for the long haul, providing um, that international solidarity, doing our work, uh, and making sure that we're supporting those that are fighting uh, within their own country for human rights. We uh, absolutely will be there for, for the long run. We are... Um, and have been in Libya. Uh, we were in Libya throughout um, what was happening in that country, uh, in Benghazi, in Mistra, in other parts of, of Libya during uh, the build-up and the, the, the aftermath of the fall of Gaddafi. Uh, and we will continue uh, that work. In Syria, I think uh, I'll spend a little time on what we're doing there and, and the situation there. And I think it's possibly emerging as one of the most complex uprisings of the, the region. Um, uh, there are something like 40,000 people who have died uh, since pro-reform protesters took to the streets in February last year. Many have been shot by security forces while participating in peaceful protests or even while attending the funerals of others who have been killed. And this number continues to rise. Like other countries that I've talked about, the desire to be rid of poverty, corruption and repression is a key driver for this uprising. For people standing up for their rights, thousands of Syrians have been detained or arrested by the country's authorities. Many held incommunicado at unknown locations where torture and other ill treatment are rife. There have been extrajudicial executions and other unlawful killings, arbitrary arrests and forced disappearances. Uh, and we've also seen uh, abuses by members of the armed opposition. So obviously it's the government forces that are perpetrating most of the abuses, but we are also seeing some of the armed, uh, some of the, some of the uh, armed op opposition groups uh, um, um, involved in abuses uh, too. And it's absolutely the case that governments in the, in, in the government in Syria has the primary responsibility to uh, cease these human rights abuses, to rein in its security forces and reform them. Um, but the international community also has a key role to play in putting human rights on the agenda by joining the calls for accountability and respect for human rights, and they must ensure that their own actions and interests don't undermine human rights. Um, in Libya, for example, the UK uh, must put respect for human rights at the core of the agenda there with the Libyan authorities and invest and share its expertise, especially in security sector reform and the rule of law principles. And for, as I say, for Amnesty, our work priority, prioritizing uh, countries in that region, particularly Egypt, Libya and Syria, will continue.